Welcome to Chapter 9, Gang. Building Features and Concerns. Our objectives for this chapter define the primary types of windows and doors, list common building utilities and their associated hazards, classify cornices and parapet walls and their related dangers. Describe the term facade and list the inherent hazards of facades. Understand the hazards of remodels, renovations, and additions. Delineate fire ground concerns of fire escape and roof hazards. Finally, describe the hazards of drug labs, pack rack conditions, and abandoned buildings. In this chapter, we're going to talk briefly about the 800 pound gorilla, windows, doors, utility systems, alternative energy systems, overhead hazards, renovations and remodels, light wells, skylights and atriums, and other miscellaneous hazards. And then we'll tie it all together with a practical exercise in the chapter review. The 800 pound gorilla. Every building has some very obvious features that could possess some threat, obstacle, or challenge for firefighters, yet they are often overlooked. Likewise, there are specific features that are hiding and ready to pounce. The obvious and not so obvious features we're talking about include windows, doors, utility systems, overhead hazards, renovations, remodels, light wells, skylights and atriums, and other miscellaneous traps. While most buildings contain the first three features, some buildings may host all seven. Regardless, each presents concerns that can impact the safety of firefighters. Therefore, it warrants repetition that firefighters need to study the information and then go out and study the buildings in their district. Look for these features and concerns and denote them in training activities and pre-plans. That way the 800 pound gorilla will not pounce you. Windows are a readily visible part of the building construction, yet they can easily be overlooked during the formulation of a size up due to their commonality. Nevertheless, the windows can provide a host of valuable clues, such as presence of smoke, heat and or fire, potential access and egress routes, the likely floor plan of the building, probable error of the building, possible renovations, as well as the presence of trapped occupants. So with windows, let's go over some key construction terms first. Frame, the structural case or border into which a window is set. Glazing, the glass and or thermoplastic that is set into a window frame. Sash, the metal wood or plastic framework that surrounds and supports the glazing. Now, let's look at the types of windows. There are four types of windows. That is your stationary, sliding, pivoting, and swinging. The stationary windows are firmly mounted and non-opening. The sliding windows are made with two overlapping parts and those are the sashes. They either move in a horizontal or vertical direction. Pivoting windows pivot in the middle of the sash, placing the glass both inside and outside the structure. Then we have the swinging windows and those windows are the ones that have the sash and glass that swing inward or outward. The examples of a swinging window include casement, awning, hopper, projected, and jealous types. 
Because of their simplicity, the most common type of window that you're going to see in most structures is the vertical and horizontal sliding windows. Now, on to the types of glass. Glass is a brittle material that is derived from silica, soda ash, and lime, along with other trace materials. These materials are heated to a molten state, then formed and cooled using a variety of methods. Now, here's the trick. Different types of glass can be created or just by just adjusting the basic heat and cooling formula or by the addition of some sort of specific chemical or reinforcing material. So let's look at some of the more common types of glass. First, we have the plated or annealed glass. Annealed glass is the most common type and is formed by slow control cooling of the silic soda ash lime mixture. It is the least expensive type of glass and is used where strength is not required. Often this is what you're going to find in your residential type windows. In older structures, this was the first type of glass that was used and when looking at it from the side, it kind of appears that wavy formation. The modern glass used in newer structures have more of that smooth Excuse me, textured surface. Plate or annealed glass is easily broken and will do so in large sharp shards that can definitely be a cutting hazard. It also has poor resistance to heat and depending on its thickness will easily crack when contacted by flame or ambient smoke. And this is usually done happens around 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat strengthened glass. The heat strengthened glass is used where you need more strength. It is produced by subjecting the glass to a temperature of around 1,150 degrees Fahrenheit and then it's quickly cooled. This makes the glass stronger, but not as strong as your tempered glass. This type of glass is typically used in modern residential and commercial applications. Heated strengthened glass takes more effort to break than your just standard plate glass. And then when it does break, it breaks into uh, smaller shards than that uh, plate or annealed glass. Timber glass is also one of those heat treated glasses. That way it increases its strength and of course it's rapidly cooled. It can be up to five times stronger than the annealed glass and it's commonly used in glass doors in some buildings. It can also be found in high-rises. Uh, a lot of times building codes require the tempered glass on either side of an entry door in a commercial building. Uh, the tempered glass can often be identified because the word tempered is edged into one or both of the corners of the glass. Although it is tough to break, you can do so with a pick head axe or some sort of uh, center punch or tool, something of that nature. And once you hit it with that pointed edge, what it's going to do, it's going to start crumbling and breaking up into a bunch of small pieces. And then given whatever force or direction is pushed on it, it'll fall inward or outward depending on how you, you press on it. And of course, breaking up into small pieces. Next we have laminate glass, also known as safety glass. And essentially all you have is just your standard tempered glass and then it's sandwiched in between two sheets of a polyester or polyvinyl film. This is a common place and it's used with glass doors which require an extra measure of strength. In addition to providing strength, the laminate film serves to keep the broken glass actually in the sash. The film can be torn from the sash with a common tool with minimal manual effort. Next, we have wire glass, which is one of the most difficult glasses to break and of course remove. And basically the wire glass, you have that wire mesh 
that's in the center of the glass. The glass is formed around it, which adds a total uh, in strength, an increase in strength and stability. Next, we have thermoplastic compounds. And to me, this really shouldn't be listed in here, but that's okay. Uh, it's not really glass at all. It is just a really strong plastic compound that's made up to look like glass and mirror the same characteristics. However, it is 250 times stronger than safety glass. Uh, they can be broken in the traditional manner and often require the use of power tools to get through. So this is something that you would see uh, where security is definitely a concern. When we're talking about windows, another type that's out there is your air blast resistant windows. And this is a result of uh, post 9-11 world where it's still just your basic window, but there's some sort of mean or medium to minimize the effects of the flying glass. Either some sort of uh, plastic coating over it, or maybe a curtain, something of that nature, possibly mesh. Next, you have your hurricane resistant glass, which is often called impact resistant glass. This type of glass has become increasingly popular on the eastern seaboard uh, and of course the Gulf Coast after hurricanes such as Andrew. Hurricane resistant glass can take on several forms, but it is very difficult to remove. For example, of this type of glass, see the feature title impact resistant windows and doors uh, as an example. The next one we have is your ballistic resistant glass uh, and it's mistakenly called bulletproof. But this glass is formed using various polycarbonate layers with glass. The thickness varies according to the firearm projected size and velocity it's designed to stop. That is why they don't call it bulletproof. The glass can only resist so much based on its thickness. The thickness also determines the difficulty of course forceful entry. The thicker it is, the harder it's going to be uh, for us to get through it. Finally, we have energy efficient glass and depending on the type of glass, there, there's just a whole list of things that can make the window energy efficient, whether it be uh, double or triple pane windows where you have two or three panes with gas in between them to add it for uh, extra insulation, or it can be others that have some sort of protective coating or film in there to reduce the amount of sun coming in like tinting, um, you name it, anything that makes it a better insulator and it's going to be labeled energy efficient. Now, of course, the problem with that is once we begin trying to break into these windows, a lot of times you have that uh, like laminate glass effect. Uh, so it may take a minute to uh, push it all in or out or, or cut that uh, film out of the way so you can make egress into the structure or get somebody out. So let's look at some other issues that we can have here with our windows. Uh, first and foremost, security bars. And we've all probably seen them. A lot of times you see them at commercial, sometimes residential structures. And those are adhered or fixed uh, to the frame using bolts and nuts and things of that nature. So this definitely creates a forcible entry nightmare. And it, obviously if you have folks doing interior firefighting, that could be an egress that's blocked. So thought needs to be considered on uh, removing them some way, whether it be... Uh, K-12 saw, maybe uh, a good reciprocating saw, torch, uh, using cutters, spreaders, whatever the case may be. Next, we have barricaded windows. And these are windows that are often found in, say, your vacant or abandoned structures. And a lot of times you have plywood or OSB just kind of screwed or nailed into them, which in itself probably wouldn't be that big of a deal to get in and out. But uh, in the text, they talk about HUD windows, the Housing and Urban Development. And what they do is they go in and they add two by fours on the inside 
to strengthen that barricade so it really makes it more difficult to forcefully get in and out of the structure and of course this is an attempt to you know minimize homeless people coming in and theft and things of that nature so that's definitely something to keep in mind if you're fighting fire operations if you again have folks in there doing interior firefighting and you want to use that as a good egress thought needs to be taken in consideration on how to properly and safely uh, get that out okay some other things to keep in mind when you're looking at windows windows that are flush with the exterior wall typically indicate that it's a wood frame construction conversely windows that are inset in the walls normally indicate concrete or masonry walls and this is due to the thickness of the wall of course the uh, characteristics of the window can be an excellent indicator of the type of room or area behind the window and here's some examples listed in the text you can have small frosted windows which can indicate a bathroom area and are normally above a countertop or a shower bath. These types of windows are poor entry points for personnel and also provide minimal ventilation. Next, we have unfrosted windows that are higher on a wall uh, than normal, and this indicates a window that is above a countertop, likely a kitchen. Then we have our picture type windows, which indicate family rooms, dens, or other uh, large rooms like that you have your smaller windows that are between floors and a lot of times those indicate a stairway your rectangular windows on the side or back of a residence may indicate bedrooms the size of the window near grade level can indicate the presence of a cellar or a basement possibility the presence of air conditioners, blind shades, or curtains or attic windows indicate the presence of a living area that can have minimal uh, egresses or ingresses. And considerations and maximum search implications should kind of be focused on those areas. Large windows may be plate or tempered glass and can provide large openings but must be carefully broken because we're not you know 100 sure of what kind of glass that really is and then of course our older structures used a double hung window with wooden frame typically more modern residential structures use either a stationary window or a sliding window uh, with lightweight aluminum or vinyl frames the older structures with the aluminum or vinyl frames can indicate window renovations and may be an indicator of additional interior renovations. Windows on a wall that are noteworthy uh, in terms of distance of bud grade will not be usable for access and egress and also may not be viable for ventilation. Your ballistic resistant glass should immediately raise two noteworthy concerns if you have those other security features in exterior doors and increased time uh, needed for fire ground operations as this class is a viable option for protecting occupants it should be expected that additional money would be spent to guarantee the same level of protection for your doors uh, so that's going to be a, a definite indicator of, hey, if they got bulletproof glass, the odds are they've got some heavily duty reinforced doors. So that's going to cause some definite um, forcible entry issues. So when you're doing your pre-plan and looking at this, make sure you find out and take good notes on these doors and where are the weak points at them so you can make forcible entry in a timely manner. Okay, on to doors. Doors are similar to the windows in that they can be easily overlooked in conducting initial size up as all buildings have them. However, your doors can offer some advantages over windows. Doors are usually the largest openings, which enhances the deployment of resources through them. Doors are the normal point of access into a structure. 
and in some commercial structures, access can only be gained through doors due to the lack of windows. Lastly, doors allow personnel to enter a structure at a lower level than will a window, and that is important if heat and smoke are present. So let's look at some of our key terms or our parts of our door assembly. A door is defined as a moving panel or other cover used to close an opening in a wall. Doors can be comprised of a single material or a frame that sports various materials. Jam, the structural case, borders, or tracks into which the door is set. A jam supports and many contain the stops for the door. Jams are normally constructed of wood or metal. The jam is also the mounting location for some sort of hinge on uh, the, the swinging door. Now we have a strike, which is a receptacle that receives a deadbolt or latch from a locking mechanism. A protrusion that stops the door and keeps it from swinging past the jam. Finally, we have the lock. Various types of locking devices are used for fight security. Common examples are a key and knob top lock set, a tubular deadbolt, a rim lock, a mortise lock, exit locks, and, auxil and auxiliary excuse me, locks. All right, so now we have types of doors. There are four, your swinging door, your sliding door, your overhead door, and your revolving door. Swinging doors are hinged on one side and either swing to the left or right and inward or outward. Sliding doors move horizontally, again, either left or right, to open and close an opening. Then you have overhead doors, which are mounted above an opening and travel vertically or swing upward. Kind of like your uh, garage door is a good example. And then finally, we have revolving doors, which consist of a multiple, uh, multiple panels that revolve around a center hub. They are almost exclusively glass with a metal frame and are found in high traffic applications like hotels, airports, department stores, etc. To help conserve energy uh, by minimizing the transfer of heat and cold air out. So let's look at doors. And first we're gonna look at wooden doors and they may be hollow core panel or solid core. So there are three subcategories here for your wooden doors. A hollow core door consists of a solid wood frame surrounding a core of like wood strips or cardboard. This is one of your cheap, lightweight, a lot of times interior kind of doors for bedrooms. And then you have your wooden panel doors which uses a solid wood frame and it's inset with panels, and the panels are the weakest portion of the door. Then you have a solid core door, which is a strong type of door compared to the previous three types of doors, and this is the one that's made with solid lumber or engineered wood. Then you have your metal door, and your metal door can be solid wood covered in sheet steel or something of that nature or it can just be hollow with uh, metal on the outside and of course this is you know stronger than your wooden doors then you have your overhead doors which include uh, rolling sheet curtain sectional tilt up like garage doors things of that nature so with that you also have your glass doors and there are two basic types of glass doors. You have frameless and aluminum frame. The uh, frameless glass doors use tempered glass that's about three quarters of an inch thick with an aluminum cross member at the top and bottom to support it and some sort of locking mechanism. This door can be categorized as a substantial door uh, in terms of being able to get through. Then you have that aluminum frame, and again, this is another part of, gla of the glass doors. And aluminum phrase doors employ an aluminum frame around heat treated tempered or laminate glass. This door can be found on commercial buildings of all types and can also be a uh, substantial door to get through. 
Then you have your bulkhead doors, although your bulkhead doors are um, covered stairs that allow access or egress from a basement or a cellar, they are not often considered true doors. However, they are a type of door that opens outward and is normally securely locked uh, from an intruder's viewpoint. And access to a cellar basement is a potential opportunity to be able to gain easy access to the interior of a structure. Therefore, bulkhead doors are normally made of metal and have some sort of substantial locking mechanism. And of course, that can be a, a formal opponent when we're trying to force entry in a timely manner. Doors that have security bars can be divided in your two categories, interior and exterior. Your interior can be wood or metal outward swinging doors, and they may have a bar of wood or metal for additional security. This bar is placed horizontally across the interior side and is supported by two brackets attached to the door. Since the bar extends past the door jamb on both sides, the door cannot be opened outward unless the bar is removed. The presence of a security bar can often be recognized by a pair of bolt heads on the exterior of the door. Uh, this is very common on the rear door of strip malls, if you're looking at those. Uh, the next type is your exterior bar. And this is a security bar over the exterior of the door areas, which is somewhat different from security bars over windows in that they are not solid, or excuse me, they are not solid to the structure, but must swing outward normally to allow passage through the door opening. It is usually necessary to remove or open them to allow initial access to the standard door and to a structure. These types of security bars usually consist of two parts, a metal jam that is secured to the doorway opening and a metal frame that swings outward and is connected to the jam by hinges. The frame uh, supports the horizontal and vertical security bars to complete the lovely ensemble. So with security bars, they can be a nightmare in terms of forcible entry. If they're on the interior, this is gonna be that bar that runs across and keeps the door from swinging in or out. And if you're doing forcible entry on it, you're gonna to have to kind of focus some of your effort around the locking mechanism and removing that bar so you can get in. And then your exterior door is like that uh, metal bars that you see on the windows but they're hinged to a door and they can swing open or close and of course they have a pretty good locking mechanism uh, that you're going to have to get around so other door considerations are of course is it inward swinging or outward swinging what type of door and frame is it what are the locks like you know all these things you want to kind of keep in mind because if we're trying to do forceful entry, what things are we going to need? You know, are we just going to be able to do it with a flathead axe and a halligan tool? Or are you going to need to break out the K-12 saw uh, or a chainsaw or whatever the case may be to get through the door? Other things to think about doors. A single door in the center of an apartment or motel building indicates a center hallway apartment building. A lack of these doors on apartment or motel buildings can indicate garden type apartments where there's no center hallway and everything is open to the exterior of the building. If you have one that has multiple doors on the front of a dwelling occupancy, that's going to indicate multiple or separate living areas. Uh, in the textbook, if you look at figure 9-12, there are two doors and six mailboxes on the porch. This is a great indicator of three separate units on each floor. The presence of fire escapes or exterior stairways on single family type dwelling uh, homes above grade levels indicate numerous living and sleeping areas such as a boarding house, quadruplex, maybe a uh, renovated home to be turned into like a assisted living type facility. Then finally, doors with visible multiple locks are, of course, an indicator of a common passageway in addition to uh, items of value behind the door. 
So next we're going to briefly look at utility systems and we're talking about utility systems we're, we're talking about um, such things as electrical and gas which are the two primary ones that we think about as firefighters you know you shut off the gas to the structure at the meter you flip the breakers for the electrical uh, then after that you may think about some other less important things I say less important but to, to us in firefighting it seems a little less important but uh, like shutting water off to the structure so to help with salvage and overhaul operations uh, possibly even uh, shutting off the HVAC system and things of that nature so let's first look at electrical utilities and I tell you in this day and age we are driven by power and lots of it some problems to think about is once you even shut the electricity off to the structure a lot of times these places have backup generators and things of that nature uh, to keep their products or whatever the case may be from um, being damaged from the lack of power so let's look at some of our electrical uh, basic components first is the supply feed which is a power from the grid and what we mean by grid we mean the electrical grid and can come into the building through overhead power lines or from an underground conduit then you've got your main shutoff and for most residential buildings the main shutoff is uh, exterior mounted the main shutoff for commercial buildings can be exterior or interior and an electrical meter is generally considered the main shutoff where the presence of multiple meters can intake a number of separate units so that would basically uh, like here in the picture on the right um, pull on the meter and a lot of departments frown on this so stick with your local SOG or SOP um, sometimes they require the power company to actually do that in terms of shutting the power off to the structure then you have your power distribution circuit protection and this is the breaker box which may be collocated with the main shutoff firefighters can inspect multiple breaker boxes in your larger buildings you also have transformers and buildings that require higher voltage more than 220 or 480 and or multiple phase electric supply will also have transformers to help regulate the voltage needed to various equipment appliances in general use your transformer boxes are often located externally and they can either be pad mounted meaning on the ground or underground on rooftops and if you look again to the right that green box that you see uh, below the um, meters is an excellent picture of a transformer type box of course you got to have your distribution wires and knobs and two wiring was a common uh, underground wiring system that we used to use in the late 1800s through the 1930s this system is easily to spot as it includes single minimal insulated wires supported by ceramic knobs um, which used a spacer to support them between wire runs you know a lot of times you can kind of see some of these uh, lines still out there in real rural areas or uh, I, I've noticed them on um, old abandoned train track sections uh, the hot wire and neutral typically run parallel to each other which are separated by the uh, ceramic knobs and then of course they have a ground wire uh, which is not present and they have porcelain or cloth tubes which were used whenever a wire passed through a wall or stud or floor junction box a cloth tube or a loon was used where the two wires crossed or where a wire entered a junction or outlet box however the most modern electric runs within a building are accomplished using wires they're now dual insulated or multi-wire meaning you have you know your hot wire and your neutral wire and ground wire and they're all wrapped in a single non-metallic sheath often called Romex 
Although that is a trade name, wire runs are typically located behind interior walls, below floors, and above ceilings. Uh, pretty much they're everywhere, right guys? Uh, there are permanent wires ran that are exposed and required to be within certain protective conduit. Next, you have your outlets, your switches, and your junction boxes. And those are all, you know, orifices that can be internal or external. A lot of times, the, the ones, the outlets that are outside uh, have that little RF switch to help prevent with uh, shock hazards or if they're near water switches and junction boxes um, junction boxes are when you have wire you know coming in and going out they can be used to power other different features in homes as well as businesses finally you have your ground gradient which is term used to describe the electricity that is returning to zero potential through non-conductive surfaces like soil concrete and masonry down wires can create a ground gradient in concrete ways from their contact on those materials and travel for several yards. Firefighters who feel tingling through their boots should shuffle step, meaning keep them together. You don't want to step from one gradient to another uh, gradient area. Otherwise, that's going to do a uh, complete a circuit and begin conducting electricity and unfortunately you are the one that is going to be conducting it in the next section you're talking about your utilities and your gas systems so what we mean by gas systems you're talking about your heated furnaces your radiant space heaters your cooking appliances dryers and other manufacturing type equipment so propane and natural gas are the two most common utility gases. Propane, of course, is heavier than air, and natural gas is lighter. Utility gases are stored in tanks a lot of times outside a building and are usually in liquid form. Fire impingement on these tanks can, of course, lead to your blevies. Your gas shutoffs are typically located outside natural gas, is shut off at the meter with a half turn of an inline valve. Propane is shut off, of course, by twisting valve located under a protective cover atop the propane tank. Other issues are HVAC systems, including heating and cooling appliances, which power a full source of convenient type systems and temperature regulating systems. Your rooftop HVA systems create significant firefighting risk, namely a concentrated dead load that can rapidly collapse during fires. Also, your HVAC air ducts can also be considered smoke and fire ducting, meaning they can, uh, of course, transfer it. Then you have your uh, communication data systems, which have expanded in modern times and now present more hazards to firefighters. Freshwater systems and wastewater systems are also things to keep in mind. Again, your freshwater system, where is your water shut off to the structure? Um, when the structure, of course, is on fire, those PVC pipes, things of that nature, copper, can, can be damaged or melt and begin uh, leaking the fresh water all over the place and create more water damage for the business owner or residents. So that's something that we need to take care of. Your communication and data systems that we talked about have all kind of hazards in terms of the wire itself, if it ever burns. And the potential that some of these wires uh, do can carry, you know, low voltage or lightweight current going through them. Uh, then finally, we've got to be mindful of your wastewater systems. Unlike freshwater systems, these sewer systems can't be shut off. So wastewater systems are considered open systems in that they are vented the outside, which assist in uh, gravity rotational drainage and they may have those vent stack pipes which are used for this venting purpose 
and this provides a ready conduit for fire extension that's something that we need to keep in mind smoke existing or emitting from these stacks as viewed from the building exterior are calls to investigate in terms of fire spread uh, in terms of your attic your trusses your lofts and your walls Solar energy. Solar energy can be harnessed in multiple ways. Although most is associated with the traditional rooftop solar panels as the primary method. Buildings can harness the sun's energy for heating purposes through the use of large collector windows that heat an interior airspace and then the heated air is then circulated throughout the building through a series of ducts and shutters and this is known as a passive system. Some passive solar systems have fans and high-tech dampers that help distribute the heat. During building fires, the passive solar systems can accelerate fire and smoke spread throughout the building given the open flow nature of the system. Buildings with passive solar features are easier to spot as they will typically have an entire exterior wall that is glass. Often the passive solar collection room appears as an addition to the building. All right, so let's look at the two types of systems that we're mainly going to see, and one being the solar water heating panels and the other being the solar PV panels. The solar water heating panels that are familiar to most common and easily identified by their common place being on the roof of a structure. And what it does is it collects the most solar radiation during the daylight hours. And by their typical characteristic black rectangular shape, the PVC pipes are used to transfer the water from the panel to the lower levels of the structure. These panels can use collected energy to heat domestic fresh water and the heat water used in radiators for general space heating are circulating the water throughout swimming pools. In a close coupled system, a storage tank is mounted above the panels on a roof and heats the water naturally through a rise uh, into the tank. In a pump circulated system, the tank is mounted below the level of the panel and a pump moves the water between the tank and the panels. Although both of these systems are relatively simple, they can add an additional complexity to a roof and possible negate roof ventilation in some cases. Most solar or water heating systems don't circulate the actual fresh water through the panels. They use a more viscous fluid that absorbs and releases the heat more efficiently than the water. This fluid passes through a marine or immersion type heating exchanger located within the building to heat the fresh water. In all cases, the panels, piping, and fluid basically add a significant amount of weight on the roof, and that's really what we're concerned about. Additional slower uh, solar fluid panels are hot to the touch and during daylight hours. Solar water heating panels are typically larger and weigh much more than the photovoltaic PV panels that we'll discuss here in just a second. The solar PV panels are much different than the ones used for hot water because these are more kind of gridded off in squares as well as they have thinner appearance, not as thick. And of course, they are used to produce solar energy to help run the house as opposed to just heat water. The PV cells convert the sunlight into electricity as light strikes some sort of semiconductor within the cells. Although various materials can be used for the semiconductor, the most common is silicone and a micro thin relective metal compound. Solar cells are normally comprised of an array of various sizes of solar panels and basically depending on their output they have an inverter that does a direct current or alternating current. The necessary wiring and quite often a battery complex for storage and backup are also present with these things.
Solar cells can be found either mounted or fixed on racks on the ground, or more interesting to fire ground personnel, mounted by frames just supported on a roof. The rooftops versions can also be integrated into the roof covering in the form of shingles. They appear as a tile shingle that are flush with other shingles but have a glass-like finish. Electrical power is always being generated by these cells and if light is present, even on a cloudy day. Um, so basically, you should leave these suckers alone. Uh, so you should treat them as live. Some may have a disconnect on the unit itself, although most feed wires that lead to a junction box somewhere near the main electrical panel, and that's where the power can be shut off at the main electrical panel or the inverter. Uh, be warned that DC power will remain in the panel and the wires are up to the shut off. Now with these solar power generating panels, there are two types. There is the off-grid and grid system. And what they're referring here to the off-grid is one that is a battery backup system. So the cells generate power all day long. They go into some sort of lead-based battery where the energy is stored until the appliances are flipped on and it's ready to use. The second system, the one that's actually on the grid, is kind of neat in the sense that it generates electricity for the home to use. And what the home doesn't use, uh, there's a system of wiring in place where it goes back to the supplier where that energy is basically sold or bought by the supplier because the home that's generating it, it's not using it. Now, when we think about these solar cells, uh, what we're really concerned about, one, is how much energy is coming through those suckers and what are the additional weight requirements on the roof. And in terms of a structure fire, again, that's an increase in dead load. So if the roof becomes compromised, this is going to lead to uh, more quickly of a structural collapse. And then you also have you know, the other shingles uh, that are the other panels that are also like shingles that are flat in nature and that can definitely create an issue when trying to um, scale the roof to do ventilation. So definitely go, don't go hacking into these things without shutting the powers off. And then of course remember if it's a direct current system you're still going to have power in the line. So uh, it's safe bet just to leave this stuff alone. All right, fuel cells. Fuel cells are not new, but the emphasis on them has been accelerated as a result of the Hydrogen Fuel Initiative that is part of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. A fuel cell is an electrochemical energy conversion device that converts oxygen and hydrogen into water with direct current, electricity being the byproduct of the conversion process. Although most people are aware of their use in automobiles, fuel cells are also growing more popular as a replacement for the UPS system, primarily in commercial buildings. Therefore, the fire service can sooner or later expect to encounter fuel cells in fire ground operations. Fuel cells are capable of generating electrical power with a sole byproduct of heat and water, hence their ability to be a green building as compared to a lead acid type battery. The fuel cells do not stop working as long as there is a flow of fuel into the cell. However, there are two obvious disadvantages with the fuel cell. Because they produce DC voltage, they must have an inverter to switch it to that AC current that uh, we use here in the States and all the associate wiring and relays, both of which can present an electrical hazard. The most concerning hazard for firefighters, however, is the storage and use of pure hydrogen. Remember gang, hydrogen is extremely flammable gas with the widest flammable range of any gas whatsoever. 
A uh, little history lesson there. Remember the Hindenburg? Hydrogen is odorless and totally light. Uh, the Hindenburg was a dirigible or a blimp that the Germans had, and for some reason uh, it caught fire uh, during an electrical storm and basically became a nice big Roman candle. So again, that's something that we want to steer clear and use caution. So in this next section, we're going to look at overhead hazards. So basically, we're going to be looking at cornices, parapet walls, facades, and the different components of each, and of course, why they are considered a hazard. Cornices, which come from the Latin word meaning ledge, is a horizontal molding that is a common construction feature of older commercial buildings and was originally used to divert rainwater from the building walls. However, as classical and Greek styles of architecture became more popular, the cornices were also used to basically decorate the front of the building, often by using a sizable overhang supported by corbels and or other decorative horizontal supports to, again, enhance the appearance. Now, these cornices uh, were two types. They were either stone or wood with the older style. The stone cornices were made from stone and supported by a ledge constructed in a brick facade or parapet wall. And we'll talk more about that later if you're not familiar. Uh, for support, and commonly used mortar that acts as an adhesive to the parapet facade wall. So it should be mentioned that if mortar was used as the adhesive prior to the mid 930s, it lacked that porter cement and was basically compressed to lime, which if we remember, weakens and is broken down by water. Uh, the other type was wooden tin and some plaster, and they were commonly used to construct these types of cornices and more common than stone cornices, the construction of wood cornices often began with leaving lets in a masonry exterior wall and then inserting short visible wood supports that kind of look like the um, ends of beams into the lets. And if you look in the text of figure 19, it's got a great picture of it. But the problem with both of these is they're decorative. They weren't really meant for people to stand on or to support weight. So you want to be careful in the sense that you don't put a ladder on there or try to stand on these things because um, they could quite possibly collapse and definitely be a uh, overhead hazard for the structures and people below. So newer cornices, the cornices on modern buildings are not quite as um, fancy as the older cornices, but, but they do the same purpose. They're meant to enhance the building architecture, make it look all nice and pretty. Uh, they, however, are mostly commonly made from some sort of synthetic material such as closed cell polyesterine that is then glued to the exterior wall of the building and is often finished in stucco and paint. Although this produced results in an attractive look to a building, it can also present a dangerous flammable uh, element to it as well as one, again, that is quite weak and does not support weight worth a turn. And if you look here on this slide, you see the older wood type and of course how you're worried about it um, uh, falling apart due to age and time and then at the bottom we see the more newer cornices and of course that top one is uh, wood and the bottom one is that uh, basically plastic slash stucco stuff okay a parapet wall a parapet is a continuation of an exterior wall above the roof line of a building the term parapet comes from the Italian word parapito, which means to cover and defend. Today, parapets can be used to prevent the spread of fire and improve the wind uplift resistance, but more often they are similar to cornices in the fact that 
they can alter the appearance of the building, basically make it look bigger than what it is, and hide unwanted unwanted things on the roof such as um, HVAC equipment, uh, storage, things of that nature. Uh, one of the problems with the parapet wall is it can extend from one foot to well over eight feet high depending on the oxygen and type of the wall. Problems with these obviously is again this can definitely be a collapse hazard uh, because oftentimes they're just tacked on, they're decorative, they're not meant to support weight uh, to the roof. And if they're the older style, again, that Portland cement um, and rebarb, then again, it can break down over time and of course can definitely uh, be knocked down with a fire hose and, and of course they dissolve with water. As they can be one to eight feet in high, uh, the odds are you're probably going to need another ladder just to get down uh, from one side of the parapet wall to the other. One of the main concerns of any type of these, of course, is the stability of these parapet walls. And you can see the uh, traditional here to the right at the top and the modern day. All right, the next thing that we have to worry about are facades. And facades are exterior construction features that are used on the walls of buildings to alter their visual appearance. And you have overhangs, attachments, height and shape, support, height on the roof line, and fire spread investigations are all issues with our facade walls. Facades can include false mansard, cantilever, eyebrow, or overhangs. The firefighters are faced with six considerations when dealing with facades. Overhang attachment, the height and shape of the sport, the height from the roof, and fire spread investigation issues are all concerns. If fire has extended into a facade, allow an appropriate collapse zone around the facade. Remember that most facades are constructed from some sort of lightweight construction, and facades that are covered with tile or other heavy products impose a significant dead load on the lightweight construction. Facades are not normally equipped with sprinklers and partitions to stop the extension of fire. If a facade over a primary entry and exit point is exposed to fire, consider entering and or stretching an attack line through another doorway. Because again, this is a definite collapse hazard. If the fire has extended into a facade partially from the interior of the building, there are three areas that you must check for the presence of fire. First is the origin of the fire in the building. Two, it's going to be the attic space, uh, which is common to the origin of the fire. And third is going to be the facade itself. So if you look here at um, the side view, what they're referring to here is the building catches on fire, then part B, uh, you're worried about the attic space, and then of course uh, the overhang there where you see in A and the fire spread into that issue. Also consider again the height and shape in terms of trying to make it over that facade front to get on the roof. Uh, it may be something where you want to try to attack it from the side if it's uh, not all the way around or if it is all the way around, you know, you may use some sort of aerial or bucket type device to get in there. Okay, let's hit some highlights on the renovations. Windows, doors, and roofs can often give clues to change made to a building, particularly to older buildings. Attic rooms can possess a significant danger due to the location, limited access, and in some cases, substandard construction. Anticipate the potential of rapidly changing conditions when opening knee walls. Suspended ceilings pose two significant hazards. The thin wires that hold the assembly in place and the open space above the ceiling. Tie rods, spreaders, and joists. 
rafters, tie plates are excellent indicators of an unreinforced masonry building that has been strengthened to prevent an early collapse. Exterior electric utilities that are new or that appear to be added can be an indicator of a renovation and a remodel. The rear of a commercial building can often yield valuable clues to changes such as modified electric services, types of construction, blocked opening, and other issues. Depending on the extent of the renovation, a basic rule is that interior remodeling can remove original barriers to the spread of fire, and this can result in voids that were not present in the original construction and often substitute lightweight construction for conventional construction. Additionally, it can be anticipated that the fire will burn differently as it has new avenues for extension due to the remodel. Renovation and remodeled occupancies are an indicator that a building may have a higher occupant load and a different floor plan than the original building. A light well or air shaft was originally an unroofed vertical shaft within a building and primarily used to provide sufficient light and ventilation to rooms within the interior of a building. Their use dates back to the Egyptians and the Romans. Light wells traveled from the bottom of a great floor to roof or in buildings that have a commercial occupancy on the first floor and residential units above the first floor travel from the second floor to the roof. Bow types are open to the outside at the top of a building. Because of advances in HVAC systems, atriums, skylights, and multi-story building construction techniques, a traditional air shaft light well is no longer necessary. Modern energy features that allow natural light and air in the building are categorized here into skylights, and those skylights can be broken down into the glass panel skylights, the plastic skylights, and the tubular daylight devices. Skylights allow daylight into the interior building spaces and can range from a simple glass panel to highly functional energy conserving devices. More common skylights include those made of glass, plastic, and reflective tubing. The glass panel skylights. These are normally panels of wired or strengthened glass that are held in a metal frame that is either flush with or raised slightly from the panel of a roof. Found mostly in older buildings, traditional glass panel skylight was prone to leaks as it aged and seal deterioration. It is a common to find that tar has been used as a sealant to minimize these leak issues. Likewise, it may have some additional flashing and synthetic sealants may be present, making the panel difficult to remove. Remember, if the panels are broken, the resulting shards can fall into the building and become a hazard for people inside. Your glass panel skylights can be fixed or have included hardware that makes the skylight openable. Energy efficient skylights may include an automated mechanisms that open or close the panel or operate sunshades or shutters. And this is all done by electrical or battery powered. Plastic skylights. The Tattletail 4x8 plastic bulb is a popular skylight found in legacy and newer buildings. Although the sizes may vary, most include that traditional plastic bubble-like panel in a metal frame that is attached to a wood or metal riser attaching to the roof. Smaller residential type plastic skylights are in an aluminum frame and can easily be removed with hand tools. The larger commercial grade types with the thicker metal retaining band will likely require some sort of power tool for removal. 
plastic skylights can also be flush with the roof plane and appear as colored or frosted or maybe even uh, as a fiberglass panel. The corrugated metal kit that the building uses the plastic skylight as part of the roof covering, these panels can easily bend in with uh, other roof coverings, but they will not support any significant weight. So lastly, we have a tubular daylight device. Okay, the tubular daylight device is basically a newer type of skylight. Um, it's part of the energy conserving movement. It consists of a light collecting optic small diameter reflective conduit and a diffusing fixture. The optic is visible above the roof line and appears as a small glass bubble or a pareidolic lens that focuses the light into a reflective tube. And then the tube channels light down through the attic space to a ceiling mounted light that uh, diffuses it throughout a fixture in the room. The diameters can range from 10 to 28 inches, although larger diameters are likely to be utilized in the future. Uh, the reflective conduit can be found as a straight or a bent tube. Some are flexible so they can bend around existing trusses or structural members. Small diameter T's should not be considered a structural component. Atriums are used frequently in residential and commercial applications due to their ability to provide a noteworthy amount of daylight and because of the feeling of openness and space that they provide to a structure. Atriums of moderate size can be found in residential occupancies but can be of significant size in commercial buildings, often transversing from the bottom floor to the roof in multi-story buildings. The open atrium in the middle of a hotel or mall is a good example of this design. Even though that they're open, they do have some issues. The reduced compartmentalization wall ceilings and floors can provide barriers to extensions of fire, heat, and smoke when they are removed or minimized. Extension will be enhanced as an example of a fire on the lower floor uh, to the upper floors because they're going to be quickly exposed because of the openness of this atrium. It also allows for increased air movement. So as the warm air will naturally rises, you're looking at air currents, which are going to amplify the spread of super hot heated go gases and smoke. Now, the atriums in larger commercial building malls and hotels are often used for displays or exhibits of material that is usually extremely flammable. Although many atriums have engineered ventilation systems, it is possible they may not have been designed for the additional flammable material that is exhibited in these displays. Now, depending on the size and complexity of all atriums, it may be necessary for an instant commander to confer with a building engineer in order to fully utilize the building's ventilation system. Alright, so some of our miscellaneous hazards. First being our fire escapes. And with that, you're looking at type uh, ladders, excuse me, age and location. And with fire escapes, they are common for multi-story residential and commercial occupancies that were built between the mid-1800s and approximately 1950. Factors that should be evaluated by the firefighter include the fire escape type, ladder, age, and location. The types include the party escape, uh, basically the balcony, screen, stairs, and standard escapes. Ladder arrangements can include the standard or permanent type, gooseneck and drop style, and counterbalance stairs, to name a few. Fire escapes or unreinforced masonry buildings can be considered substandard as compared to the newer versions on post in 1935 masonry buildings. The presence of a gooseneck roof access ladder on the front fire escape of a building can indicate that there is no real fire escape. Feeling occupants, or excuse me, fleeing occupants on fire escape is a visual clue that uh, indicates a higher priority for rescue of uh, victims still within the building. 
Of course, razor wire goes without saying. That is a um, definite issue uh, in terms of it can obviously impede egress of a structure as well as escape and of course entering into said structure because you're looking at big time lacerations so hands-on operations with razor wire should be employed only when necessary or as the last resort uh, razor wire made from aluminum is easy to cut and can then be separated again with great caution if absolutely necessary remember that razor wire may be under tension it can spring backwards when cut if razor wire is entwined with bob wire, the bob wire should also be cut, which is enabling the removal of the entire assembly. So also on the roof, you have cellular antennas and other communication equipment, such as base stations, antennas, equipment, hub room, coax cables, um, other communication equipment, and hazards. These all add, obviously, an increased load in the roof, which can cause them to collapse quicker. You also need to be mindful that these things can cause trip hazards, and of course, depending on what they are, uh, passageways for fire spread, as well as trip hazards on the roof. Sometimes, if you have cellular equipment on the roof, it is equipped with an extinguishing system. And you need to be careful because it can have those halon systems, which can result in toxic gases and lower oxygen levels. While the wireless, or excuse me, waterless system removes the heat, it does not do anything about uh, the oxygen. Remember to follow cellular coax cables to check for our extensions. Advertising signs and communication antenna disc will add a uh, course to the dead load. There may also be the presence of electrical utilities tied in with them as well. Pack rack conditions goes without saying. Uh, when you have hoarders and they have all this extra fire load in there, not only is it increase the heat and the fire spread within the structure, but it makes it more difficult to get into said structure as well as searching the structure and closets and things of that nature. Of course, clandestine drug labs can be an issue when they are in the interior of the building. A lot of times they have uh, chemicals that are extremely flammable and toxic that are in place and they need to be carefully dealt with oftentimes with a hazardous material team as opposed to uh, traditional firefighting. Uh, you should use your level A suits with respiratory protection when you're dealing with these clandestine labs until you can correctly identify what's going on. And then of course there's the whole law enforcement side of things where they don't want to disturb the evidence in terms of that nature so they can have a good case. Okay, your chapter review exercises here, as you can see, use the following photographs, examining the visible building features and then list the hazards they can present to firefighters. So let's go ahead and start with our traditional type, ear of construction, um, small, medium, large, that kind of stuff, and then go into our hazards. So, you know, here you're looking at, to me, a remodel uh, that used to be a house where they added onto it, looking like some sort of um, commercial type enterprise. So that alone can cause all kind of hazards. Uh, looking at the chimney, there may be some loose bricks at the top. You can see a little blue light uh, poking through, uh, just to name a few. So again, go through these next photos and do something uh, of this nature. Of course, let's do the type size ear, because that's going to be good practice. This is all tying into a final read of the building, which is what I want you to do for your final project for the class. Okay, gang, we've covered a lot. 
So if you have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstack.edu or you can give me a call in the office at 706-357-0162. Until next time, be safe and have a great day.